Welcome to uh, the AHIN Hour. This is uh, first of the start of a series of webinars where we will have uh, advocates of digital health and interoperability uh, understand what's happening uh, globally, regionally, and also in the different countries. So um, I'd like to request Lukwa before we call on Carl to show us a set of webinars that we are hosting for the next two months. Uh, the first set uh, is a set of webinars on di diagnosis related groups. And we started with this last week. Uh, Dr. Supasit and Dr. Bunchai are helping us uh, with these DRG webinars. If you want to join any of these, you can go to bit.ly slash ahin DRG training 2022. Okay, so this is a series of DRG webinars uh, to learn from the Thai experience and also to understand where the other countries are at with their DRGs. The next slide, please. And then there will be a series of webinars uh, on interoperability. Uh, uh, tonight, we are having a speaker from WHO, Mr. Carl Leitner. And then there will be a series of webinars uh, with Jose Costa Tejera. Carl again, and then our Standards and Interoperability Lab uh, Thailand uh, friends. So I'll pass the floor now to look at, note that the link for the DRG and the link for this FIRE webinar series are different. And we will share this with you later on in the chat box. So I'll call on Lukwa to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Carl. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So we are happy to have you in tonight's webinar. Adopting the WHO Smart Guidelines from Paper Policy Narratives to Digital Health System. With our speaker, Dr. Carl Leiner. So during the session, you may leave your questions in the chat box. They will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Microphones and webcams of attendees are temporarily disabled during the presentation, but will be enabled during the Q&A. If you are having technical difficulties, you may chat with the AHIN Secretariat and we will try to assist you as much as possible. This webinar is being recorded. Materials from this session will be shared via email. For Overview of the webinar. Today, Dr. Carl Leiner will present the pathways towards digitizing clinical, public health, and data recommendations. He will also, also show how countries can systematically evolve from the level one narrative guidelines to level three computable representations of guidelines. So our speaker tonight, Dr. Carl Leiner, is a technical officer digital health and innovation at World Health Organizations. So he has more than 15 years of experience in informatics, information technology, software development, and education, and all 15 years in designing and adapting open source interoperable digital health system in low and middle income countries. So please welcome now Dr. Carl Leiner. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to connect with you today and discuss the WHO Smart Guidelines. I'm going to go ahead and screen share and hopefully you're able to see something um, at the moment. Um, we can see it. Thank you, Carl. Great. Thank you. Um, so wanted to give an overview today on the WHO Smart Guidelines, where they're coming from, a, a little bit of, about the types of artifacts um, that they are uh, that are produced during the sort of SMART guidelines process. Um, and as indicated earlier, this is uh, the series of uh, webinars. And um, while we could go into a lot of detail today, we will, um, uh, I'm afraid we wouldn't have the time um, to do so, but luckily we will have other opportunities um, to, to follow up. Um, but to give a little bit of background context uh, is that WHO guidelines are are um, uh, a critical resource for uh, a lot of the world. And many countries are adopting WHO guidelines. Um, at the same time uh, that they're adopting these guidelines, um, they're looking at digitizing their health system. And um, this has been further accelerated during the COVID pandemic. 
Um, and so the need to have digitized versions of those WHO guidelines is, is really paramount at this point. Um, a few uh, challenges that we faced is that there are hundreds of guidelines that exist from WHO and take going from a, a narrative um, guideline into a, a digital tool that's adherent and faithful to that existing guideline is a complicated process. Um, um, and we'll, we want to ensure that that process is done well. Um, and particularly as these guidelines are, are shaping the behavior across country health systems um, and, and helping to drive some of those changes, um, ensuring that we do this right is, is um, very critical. Um, so um, I think that in terms of the value of these guidelines, um, the, they protect millions of, of children from uh, potentially life-threatening diseases. Um, for example, immunization schedules and, and having those um, uh, uh, adopted by multiple countries and, and adhered to um, is a, a life-saving measure. Um, reduce the incidence and mortality within HIV programs um, when understanding ART eligibility and um, scale up and coverage or reducing maternal and um, perinatal mortality morbidity uh, by ensuring that routine care and, and management of pregnancy and, and routine pregnancy and, and complicated pregnancies is, is done according to the guidelines. Uh, these are just three general areas of, of, of smart guide of guidelines that WHO releases that also have a corresponding smart guideline um, um, being developed or, or already developed for them. Uh, if we look at the process that um, is typically undertaken during the guideline development. It starts uh, for the WHO guideline development, it starts with the WHO um, looking at the, the clinical um, evidence for the development of those guidelines. And it goes through um, a, a long process in consolidating that evidence from countries. Um, uh, once a guideline is published, that's typically adapted by uh, at the country level by uh, the Ministry of Health by member state um, reflecting some of the contextual realities of, uh, of the country um, existing guidelines that the country already has uh, or protocols um, as well as existing infrastructure and um, health informatic standards um, uh, this could be terminologies for vaccine codes or, um, different disease classifications, but um, in general, the, the, the adaptation process takes um, both the, the, the WHO um, existing narrative guidance as well as the country-specific context into place. Once that's been developed, um, those uh, adapted guidelines are then um, sent to implementation and technology partners for implementation into digital solutions. Um, and then um, deployed to the health workforce and health service users. Um, now, um, sort of the current process today or, or over the past few years is that among all of these steps, there's lots of room for, um, uh, for issues to creep in um, uh, in terms of the quality of the guidelines that are ultimately de delivered to the, the users and the health workforce. Um, one, um, is that this is a, a fairly long and extensive process. And so anything that we can do to um, make that quicker um, and more complete will facilitate um, rapid adherence to guidelines, um, whether they're the WHO direct or the country adaptation. It's also quite resource expensive um, and resource of intensive and, and a, difficult to adopt. Um, Typically, the, the WHO um, narrative guidance doesn't come with the artifacts that we would want to give to the implementation and technology partners, such as requirements documentation, workflows, user personas, um, uh, and, and what we're left with is um, each country or perhaps each implementation partner in a country going through that process and developing um, those uh, requirements themselves. There's certainly a, a, a lot of opportunities to um, leverage the, the work that's being done to, to stop that duplicative work from happening uh, and to in, 
uh, help better ensure sort of scalability and, and broader use and uptake of the guidelines if we can um, reduce the that burden for um, implementation and technology partners. We also have a challenge is that um, often those implementation technology partners are not the subject matter experts that it originally contributed to the, the WHO or Ministry of Health guidelines. Um, and so uh, because of that, when they're trying to understand and, and the somewhat uh, or can be highly technical medical and clinical content in the guidelines, um, uh, they won't have access to those SMEs to understand subject matter experts to understand what was really intended um, and we lose fidelity um, as we try to digitize those guidelines fidelity with the original intent and purpose um, and as those those artifacts such as the functional requirements um, etc will will make it difficult to to ensure that there's that fidelity um, uh, and finally when those are taken up into digital health solutions, oftentimes uh, those are not done with international standards uh, and which makes it difficult to share um, information across systems, to calculate indicators, to ensure that, uh, uh, that we have continuity of care for a patient regardless of which particular system uh, a health facility is using at the time. I'm sure that you're all familiar with these challenges, but it's also good to um, uh, help motivate what is a, a quite comprehensive um, and long um, vision of, of the WHO around smart guidelines. Um, so just sort of the current state, we have time delays um, so that patients are denied access to care. We have diminished accuracy, so health services are compromised. We have the limited ability to evaluate and adapt, so delayed improvements to health practices in passive dissemination mechanisms uh, from the guidelines um, limit the, the impact at scale that we can have. So smart guidelines are really trying to address all of these um, uh, uh, challenges through process technology and people. Um, so as a process um, perspective, WHO is updating uh, um, how guidelines are developed in process uh, in general. Um, so the usual produce a long PDF document and that's the end of the, the guideline development process is now um, changing. Um, instead, going forward, WHO guidelines will be developed with the smart guidelines um, in mind and that the, the, the narrative guidance is the first step of, of multiple layers of of guidance that could be developed, uh, including the digital layer. Um, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, additionally, we're looking at uh, creating an ecosystem of tools, particularly open source tools, but not um, exclusively so, that de uh, to develop and implement um, the SMART guidelines. Um, so both from a management of the content of the guidelines to the actual implementation of those guidelines and a mobile device or, or an EMR um, that we want to ensure that there is a, a large ecosystem of tools um, uh, available um, so that member states have the ability to select which a, a set of tools is appropriate for their context. Uh, and finally, on the people side, we recognize that the, the SMART guidelines approach and the adoption to standards is um, is still a, a new approach and, um, and leveraging lots of new technologies and standards and that capacity building um, at all levels needs to be done with both within the Ministry of Health, the WHO, as well as the technology partners and implementers. And so this is from the, from the decision makers that need to understand what the implications of the adopting a smart guidelines approach and the benefits of doing so down to the software developers that need to understand this, the standards and um, underpinning the SMART guidelines. Um, so as I mentioned, there are multiple layers to the our guidelines, um, the SMART guidelines, starting with L1 or layer one, the narrative layer. So this is the traditional WHO guidelines. Um, this would be, for example, a family planning guideline or um, the consolidated HIV guidelines. 
These are developed by the subject matter experts um, based on evidence, um, 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 but are generally um, written with a narrative set in mind and, and not immediately applicable well, to this software development process. So the next layer, L2, is the operational, uh, which is getting into uh, essentially what a business analyst would um, typically produce, um, uh, building off the, the narrative guidance. So these are um, things like structured workflows, data dictionaries, um, decision support documentation, um, users, um, user personas, um, really documenting out um, in, uh, in terms of the software development process, the requirements for a um, uh, software components. Getting into the level three, the, or layer three is the machine readable. These are the computable parts of the guidance. Um, these are um, specific software artifacts and um, that can be leveraged um, for software development purposes. Uh, it's taking the what was produced in the L2 layer, the, the business analyst layer, and put them, put them into um, the standards, and particularly the HL7 FHIR standards for um, data modeling and exchange um, and leveraging um, the various terminology standards such as ICD, um, LOINC or others as appropriate. So the L3 aspects are really getting down to the, um, how do we do this in practice? Um, and the L4 is getting into the um, actual software um, code itself, the executable software tools, the applications, the EMRs that are taking the components from the L3 um, level, the FHIR implementation guides, and actually implementing them in uh, software tools for use at a country level. Um, WHO is, is producing um, artifacts at the L1, the L2, and the L3. Um, at the L4 level, um, while there might be some specific projects, the, the focus of WHO will be at reference implementations of the L4 um, artifacts. So these are designed not necessarily for production, um, um, though could be a basis for production systems, rather they're there for um, uh, to accelerate testing and development of um, L4 artifacts. So if you, for example, want to develop an, a mobile app um, to, to do data collection, um, and ensure that it uh, can exchange using some of the FHIR standards, you don't wanna to have to stand up the full stack of, of tools that you would exchange with, you just wanna focus on the development of your tool and connect with the existing reference implementation. Um, and then uh, we will also use this referencing reference implementation as a basis for a clearinghouse of digital health tools. Um, which we are in the process of standing up. So uh, what we will have is the ability for a, a specific application to say, oh, I adhere to the uh, antenatal care guidelines from WHO, and here are my sets of tests and uh, document documentation to prove that my tool can interact with these reference um, uh, uh, implementation tools and, and ensure that we do have um, fidelity of, of data exchange. And finally, looking towards the future, there's a fifth layer, the L5, the dynamic, is as we um, move to a digitized and standards-based um, environment of health data, what types of machine learning, AI-based decision support services that are uh, can be developed that are based on real-time data, looking at um, more predictive analytics um, uh, at, on a more active dynamic uh, basis rather than um, the, the slower process coming from the L1 narrative. Um, a few things of, just to say what the SMART guidelines are and what they are not. Um, so first of all, it is not a specific application. There is not a SMART guideline app. Um, there's a, an ecosystem of tools. Um, we're, we're, we're not saying that they're 
you must adopt this particular technology stack, product or platform. Um, it's not a specific clinical or data um, uh, management solution. And, and it's not an effort to um, uh, force or promote a particular software solution. Um, really, um, what SMART, SMART guidelines are is a, is a systematic way to digitize existing and uh, upcoming WHO guidelines um, and to create a set of generic artifacts or components that can be applicable to many different platforms and tools. Um, and, and taking into account what are the relevant clinical and public health data recommendations and how are they inter intertwined. Um, it also gives a way for ministries to pro provide specifications and control over the di digital health products and services that they implement. So rather than saying, uh, oh, we want to commission an app for HIV care, uh, you now have the opportunity to say, oh, we want to implement an app for HIV care that we want to ensure meets the, the main data collection standards and guidance that are coming from WHO or have been adapted by the ministry. Um, so it provides a, a neutral way to, to vet and um, uh, uh, propose digital solutions for fidelity and, and adherence to guidelines. Um, what we're, looking at in terms of breaking this down um, into sort of manageable components um, and on the L1 to L3 um, layers, the, the narrative, the um, operational and the, the computational layer is to set a, up a smart guidelines exchange that will support the authoring, testing and dissemination of smart guidelines content. So that's going to include um, things like setting up a a terminology service and product catalogs hosted by WHO for countries to utilize and adapt and, and share out their country adaptations of WHO smart guidelines. You know, there might be a, a missing data field that's very important in a country context that isn't necessarily important at a global level. And we wanna make sure that the um, smart guidelines authoring that um, happens at the WHO level uh, can happen just as easily at a, at a country level. Um, we're also supporting a, a, a deployments um, of a few um, examples of smart guidelines um, to ensure that the, the full process um, will work and that um, we can iron out any of the, the issues related to interoperability or uh, infrastructure, as well as ensure that um, there's a very pragmatic view of, of the implementation of the uh, smart guidelines. Um, uh, give you a sense of where things are um, uh, at um, in, in terms of the smart guidelines ecosystem. Um, we have, um, in terms of the L1 through L3, we've got a number of, of things in progress, including the terminology service, uh, uh, digital uh, adaptation accelerator kit authoring um, platform, that's in progress. Um, we've been working with the FIRE IG community and, and um, developing synthetic data sets and conformance testings around the FIRE implementation guides and looking at how to um, automate the, the production of FIRE implementation guides from the L2 content, from the, the data dictionaries, from the business, rule, business processes, the business rules, um, and developing an uh, APIs and, and business process to ensure that we can share out quickly the, the L3 content and the, into the applications, um, the EMRs, et cetera, um, so that it can be readily adopted um, by the local vendors and apps. Um, so a lot of this is um, either in progress or scoped um, and, um, and um, and happy to, to dig into more details at a later point if you are interested. One other thing to, to highlight here is that we're also working very closely with Google around an Android SDK that is um, designed to ensure that there's fire support in Android, um, as well as meet the needs of the, the smart guidelines. And we'll 
uh, in a future webinar, you'll see some specific examples of what that looks like. Um, looking um, at what we have published at the L2 and L3 and L4 level. Um, um, and, and for those of you that have been around for a while, the digital adaptation kits that WHO has published are essentially the L2 level and the fire implementation guides uh, are the L3 level. Um, so we have antenatal care um, uh, uh, fully developed, including a reference app. Um, similarly for family planning, um, STI is in progress, will be published soon um, with uh, the, the value sets of the term terminologies um, coming. Um, adolescent sexual reproductive health is published, HIV, um, the DAC is published, if not published already, um, and the machine readable is in progress, the, the fire implementation guide. Immunizations um, uh, is um, both the L2 and the L3 will be imminently published, um, um, and that includes routine immunizations, COVID immunizations, um, and um, AEFI. Um, for child health and emergency settings, uh, we have uh, made a lot of progress in the development of L2 and the L3 artifacts with a uh, pilot um, in uh, being planned for later this year um, um, uh, in around in three or so countries. Um, another example of a smart guideline and um, that we've been developing is the digital documentation of COVID certificates, which um, is the, um, for those of you that have traveled, it's the QR code that you can use to document your vaccination status or test results. Um, both of those have been published as L2 and L3. Sorry, this slide is a little dated. Um, and um, reference software exists fully for the vaccination status and is in progress for test results. Um, it is an example, of, uh, a very narrow example of a smart guideline in that it's providing um, a, a L2 and L3 artifacts in terms of a standardized data model uh, using FHIR and decision support services um, using um, uh, the, the smart guidelines framework. Uh, sexual uh, Self-care, um, nutrition, postnatal care are all in progress. Um, as well as what's not reflected on here is um, a number of smart guidelines related to public health surveillance um, and population health, uh, particularly around case reporting um, uh, and case management for um, uh, EIDSR or electronic integrated disease surveillance and response um, use cases. And so there are a number of those that are in the early stages of, of um, uh, being developed as well. Um, to give a very specific and concrete example, um, here is the ANC um, L1 guidance, um, which you can see is a, a PDF document um, around uh, and includes, for example, uh, anemia and folic acid supplement. Um, uh, in the L1, you can in the narrative document, you see a table of a recommendation for um, supplements and um, particularly during anemia, um, which is written in a very narrative form and um, uh, is useful for the clinicians and, and less useful for the, the software developers. Um, in the L2 and in the operational aspect, you see a more structured view of that, that similar um, um, set of recommendations, both as a workflow um, diagram in the upper right, as well as a decision logic table uh, in the lower middle. Um, so taking the, the, the L1 content and structuring it into a way that um, software developers and business analysts um, can um, utilize, but as well as uh, not so um, far down the line in terms of um, software code that um, this, uh, that the information and decision logic table and the workflow diagrams can be validated with the subject matter experts, the clinicians and the public health experts. Getting into the L3, the machine readable um, 
aspects, the fire implementation guide, um, you can see that um, we connect all the way from the L1 guidance. So referencing the specific recommendation that came from the L1 to the uh, description um, coming from the L2 as a as a workflow diagram or um, other structured um, content, a data dictionary, and on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side, you see the specific um, uh, computable artifacts. So um, in the um, uh, upper right, you'll see links to specific libraries and plan definitions, ways to express and fire um, the clinical um, workflows and the data recommend the requirements in terms of um, codings and terminology standards. And then in the lower right, you'll see uh, an example of a, a decision support service or business rule for um, uh, testing um, if somebody has anemia and providing a, a decision support or a recommendation on um, what to do um, or, or the guidance to provide to the patient um, in, in software code. And this software code um, is something called the clinical quality language, which in and itself is a standard um, for um, working with um, health, uh, health information such as the, that in HL7 Fire. Um, this software code um, can be directly executed um, in an L4 environment, or it could be used as a basis to validate that an algorithm that isn't an EMR or a mobile device is actually um, adherent to the, the set of specifications coming from the, the guidelines. Um, and finally, um, you can see an example of an L4, um, and we'll, we'll see that in a future webinar in more detail, but we've taken a HL7 fire questionnaire for data um, collection um, and um, um, based on some information, providing a, a decision support that, uh, to a health worker um, uh, from that information. And so in this way, we, we know going through this process in, in the stage process, we have um, the ability to ensure that there is fidelity at, at the very end to the, the specific clinical recommendations that was offered to the health worker um, based on the information collected. Um, finally, uh, I'll just close here and then um, with noting that uh, the WHO um, uh, smart um, guidelines at the L3 level um, has a, a template for how these should be expressed and, and put together. Um, and there's an, a sort of empty IG that shows you how to create a new SMART guideline, um, creates a checklist, uh, has a checklist of the information that you would um, want to ensure is in a, uh, a guideline. So whether it's WHO developing it or a, a member state adapting it or a process, we, we have a, a set of uh, a, a checklist that's being developed to ensure uh, quality of the SMART guidelines. Um, we, all, we also include the references and the dependency between guidelines. Um, and so um, this is you know, a multi-year effort that, it, that we're all undertaking together. Um, and you know, we are you know, at the beginning of that effort, um, um, but we think having a very structured process in which there is a high level of assurances of quality along the way is the, the best way to, to work um, on this together. So, um, um, so just to quickly note, um, as I close, that just what is the feasibility of this? Um, so just an overview of the open source and commercial fire um, uh, libraries and platforms and tools that are out there. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but you can see it. It covers quite a number of programming languages as well as um, uh, software and operating system platforms um, and approaches um, that are out there. Um, and, um, and as a preview to one of the upcoming webinars, we'll look at the specific Android 
Fire SDK that um, can, is designed to be incorporated into existing as well as new um, uh, mobile applications that includes uh, a base level of functionality for the management of um, fire um, data, its storage, um, some basic APIs um, that will help foster and facilitate the adoption of, of uh, smart guidelines with the intent that um, the software developers and, and engineers can ideally just download the smart guidelines either from WHO or for a member state and run them on their application um, and have the software developers really focus in on the, the user interface, the application logic um, and the workflows that, and not have to focus in on um, trying to interpret um, WHO smart guidelines and, and um, going through that full process of requirements development and, and representation in, in the FHIR um, set of standards. So um, the intent is to get as much for free as possible out there. Um, so thank you. Um, and I'll turn it back to the moderators for um, facilitated questions and comments. So thank you so much, Dr. Kautleine. So, so in the chat box, I saw many questions arising. So I think first question belongs to Dr. Alvin Marcello, our executive director of Dehim. So, so the question from him was, uh, when uh, where can we access the ecosystem of tools? And another question is, aside from marginal and reproductive health, are there other domains already adopting smart at global level? I think Dr. Alvin may open your mind and feel free to ask him, Dr. Please. Yeah, actually, uh, when I asked the questions uh, in the subsequent slides, Carl actually answered them, but maybe Carl just very quickly, uh, because people might have missed the slides. Where can we access the tools and um, are other programs coming out? Are you showed a list of programs already and are there other programs uh, uh, joining that list? Over. Yeah, um... I did point out a few of the tools that are there and I'm happy to, to put some more in chat that are specific. Um, maybe what we can do for the webinar is um, that's upcoming is to make sure that we've got a more exhaustive and structured list. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have um, yet a, a place where everything is available in, in one easy um, 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 landing page around smart guidelines um, and so that that is a gap that we have but um, particular things around um, some of the fire implementation guides um, and the android sdk we can put in um, for the ddcc the digital document of covid certificates there is a, a set of reference implementations and um, testing tools as well that i can um, uh, and testing framework that i can share as um, later. So happy to follow up with additional information on that. Thank you, Carl. I have other questions, but I look, what can you read the questions from the other uh, participants? I don't want to hog the QA. Okay. So another question is from Dr. Bunchai. So he asked first how the BHO headquarters, departments, and regional offices who develop narrative guidelines work with the WHO DHI department? Yeah, so the, the development of um, the narrative guidelines from HQ WHO is um, through the quality norms and standards um, uh, units, which sits within the science division. The digital health and innovation unit also sits within the, the science division and we work very closely um, um, with quality norms and standards. And currently we are in the process of um, um, updating the handbook for guideline development, um, which exists to ensure that it reflects the, the SPART guidelines process. Um, we also work very closely with the ICD team, um, the in, 
um, that does the classifications um, in ensuring that we have fidelity. Um, um, and that exists sort of in a different um, division within WHO. Um, the, the general process for the L1 guidance is a, con is a consultative process, process that includes um, subject matter experts, both internal to WHO um, at the HQ level, at the regional level, as well as external um, um, subject matter experts that are engaged. So each sort of program area has a different set of, of SMEs that they draw upon, um, but that's the general process. And um, if you have more specific questions, happy to, to, to address those. Oh, thank you, Carl. I think this is a very good initiative and I'm happy that uh, yeah, it happened because it will be very uh, convenient for the country to implement and also yeah. have. Uh, uh, to me, I'm thinking about like in the clinical, we have the clinical practice guideline and we want to interpret that into this, uh, uh, into the level one to level three. And it's already done by the, uh, the one who create the guideline. That is a very good new and thank you very much for the headquarter and regional and the, the, the collaborative works uh, on this. And I think DDCC for the uh, vaccine and DDCC for the lab test is one of the good example that uh, 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 we should go on that way. Thank you. And we are looking forward to that. I know the guideline, there is hundreds of guidelines, uh, both headquarter and regional, and they say all one. And I hope that the next one, every department that, we, that uh, developed the guideline will work like the DDCC, uh, uh, what we have. To, so that, that would be help country a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you. Yes. So next questions is from uh, Ms. Uh, Maya Agawa. So Maybe you can explain these five layers using a uh, medication adherence case, Dr. Kalbleiner. Um, sure. So um, maybe just to, to talk through what that would look like. Um, um, I don't know if it would help to, to share the screen, but it's sort of the L1 layer, it would say, um, you would have a recommendation for, you know, maybe there's a, a particular population, patient population that should be taking medications and identifying what that population is and what that medication is and the, the, the particular protocol being applied. And that would be in the L1 guidance, um, with the L1 layer. The L2, you would have the, the more structured version that would say, uh, you know, if you're registering a patient, how do you identify that they are part of that population or that patient cohort that you want to identify? What are the, the, uh, the questions that you would ask? What's the logic you would go through? What would um, the specific um, questions that you would need to ask to evaluate which um, medication that they are on? Um, um, I know there's something exactly adherence, but um, hopefully this is a good enough example. At the L3 layer, it would be, okay, here are, you know, a list of the terminologies or codes that are used for the medications. Here are the specific logic to, to note whether they are uh, adherent to their me medicine, uh, medicinal regimen based on a particular protocol and based on, oh, we know that they had a, um, were administered the drugs or, or self-administered the medications at a specific time. Um, and so that logic would be at the L3. Um, and the L4 is just the, the specific application that the health worker or the, the client is using. Um, I hope that's helping um, uh, tease that out a little bit, but I think getting into some practical examples in more detail might um, be useful. Oh, I, I, so thank you very much, Dr. Hardliner. So another question is, is from Kay Tanlas. So it's from Philippines. So hi, the Philippines through the USC law is pursuing encouraging a somewhat federated approach 
to local health information exchanges as backbone of interoperability. So does the BHO support a planning to support local governments and their local partners wishing to develop interoperability layers at the provincial and city levels? Um, yeah, I'd say there are multiple opportunities for support from WHO at the HQ, regional or country level. Um, um, and certainly we would recommend that that type of support be done in conjunction with um, and, and do work closely with um, other um, donors and agencies um, as a um, um, to provide that support to local governments and local partners. Um, at the HQ level, I think one of the main things that we're doing is ensuring that there's advocacy and, and um, around the smart guidelines and a com and support across the donors for that approach and and for this approach and and we are seeing that um, that level of uh, commitment coming in from the donors um, and and approach. So um, you know, part of I think the question is how do you communicate and. and um, ask for that type of support and I'm um, happy to, to talk, follow up more on, on approaches there. Um, um, but, you know, certainly what we see is a critical part of a successful smart guideline um, implementation is a, a critical part of uh, uh, the, the health, um, the, the cap maturation of the capabilities of a digital health system are the use of health information exchanges. And so while we might not explicitly call out a, a health information exchange in terms of the, the SMART guidelines themselves, part of the, the reference applications and the reference implementations that we discussed are, are uh, leveraging an HIE approach and particularly leveraging um, instant open HIE. Um, uh, but um, so, those are, I'd say, very compatible approaches and, and aligned with the SMART guidelines. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kartleiner. So the next question is from Mayan. Uh, he is a GP doctor counseling for depressive patients. So he has two questions. So first is, are there any SMART guidelines specifically on mental health assessment? And the second question is, how do I ensure that I practice within the strict realm of the SMART guidelines? Should I first read PDF guidelines then integrate SMART guidelines with my EMR to facilitate CDSS? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know that we have a, um, any mental health um, related SMART guidelines currently in progress unless it's related to emergency care settings, but I, I think that that's not the specific use set of uh, programmatic areas that you're interested in. Um, the, um, I'd say as noted um, by Boonshai, there are hundreds of guidelines that are, um, the WHO releases and um, um, we'll, while we intend to have as um, uh, digital um, representations or smart guidelines for all of those, you know, that's not something that we can um, do overnight. Um, however, hearing priorities and, um, and needs from, from those such as yourselves can help us prioritize and identify the, the resources that we need for, um, uh, for taking on a particular smart guideline. Um, um, for the second part of the question, should you read the PDF guideline and then integrate SMART guideline with the EMR? Um, um, I think the in, part of the hope is that um, while as a GP, the, the, the SMART guideline might be um, useful, uh, sorry, the, the narrative guidance might be particularly useful for you as to be able to, to read and understand it for those, uh, for the developers of your EMR, um, the hope is that they could start with the L2 and the L3 assets and not and only go back to the to the L1 assets if there's particular um, lack of clarity around um, 
um, a particular question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kautlainer. So I think next question is from Dr. Alvin. So what is the role of standard terminology in the SMART guidelines? Um, yeah, so in general, before answering that question, we want to make sure that all of the content is open and accessible. Um, um, so the that's why we chose the fire uh, HL7 fire set of standards as being an open set of standards. Um, similarly, for terminologies, um, we want to make sure that those are uh, that we have open standards there. So um, our starting point is to look at ICD um, uh, to see if the a particular concept is included in ICD. Um, and if not, we either identify other existing open um, and without uh, license restrictions, terminology standards such as LOINC or SNOMED GPS as, as a possibility, um, or work with the ICD team to fill in any gaps that, that we have um, in there. Um, at the sort of practical level, um, the data dictionary that's developed as an L2 um, uh, starts to cross over into the L3 when it def defines the, the specific um, codes that are used for a condition or, or observation or, or whatnot. Um, but it's really in the L3 where we see those value sets represented in the fire implementation guide. Um, um, and um, um, in, in sort of a computable, accessible way. Thank you, Carl. Look, what I can can I, can I ask my questions? Uh, yes, doctor. Carl, we have five minutes left, and um, in the audience, we have uh, at least for the Philippines, those that I recognize are EMR developers, and some are policymakers, and some are informaticians. Before I saw the WHO smart guidelines, I mentioned this to you. Some groups, like those working on hepatitis and oncology, were already implementing some sort of alignment from narrative to forms to computable representations of the guidelines. What would be your advice to them? Do, do they wait for the global artifacts to, be, to reach the region and then that will be extended at the country level? Or would you encourage them to just go ahead, follow the SMART guidelines process, uh, use what tools, uh, you showed us some tools, and in, in, in that process, it's more empowering because they're actually doing the thing that they need to do for their own country, which is what we want. There's country ownership. But at the same time, there's a possibility of fragmentation because they're now doing things at the ground level that will need to be reconnected back to a global artifact that has not yet been defined. So how do you foresee uh, managing this complexity? Because we can just wait for the global artifacts, pass down to the region, and then pass to the country. That will be the architectural approach. But that, that might take a long time. Uh, the other hand is we do the independent approach autonomy guided by your DAK, your acceleration toolkit, the GitHub uh, MT template, stuff like that. But there's a risk uh, that the countries might go in different directions. So Thailand will have their own hepatitis format. Philippines will have their own hepatitis format, so forth and so on. I, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, no, um, there's, there's certainly a need to balance sort of pragmatism from, from an ideal state of if we had done this, at the outset, um, you know, the L1 guidance does exist for a lot of that. And just because we are, are embarking on the smart guidelines process doesn't mean that, oh, we should pause any efforts on interpreting the L1 um, guidance and in, in, in implementing that in countries. Um, I think what you rightly called out, though, is that there is a, oh, if we do this, how do we? ensure that there isn't a high level of fragmentation. Um, and that's where we um, are really working through on defining the process, defining the sort of the checklists of expectations at the L2 and the L3 levels to provide um, um, countries or, or regions that want to take these approaches at least 
um, some guidance on, on how to do that so that so to decrease the fragmentation that will um, result in the end of the day. Uh, that's going to take some time to get both those processes specified, all of the, the tooling and infrastructure in place, and particularly around the smart guidelines exchange. Um, but we do um, think that a lot of the patterns and the processes that we're, we're are taking are, um, are based on um, best practices that exist outside of smart guidelines, like having a terminology service in there. Um, there's um, uh, um, maybe a, a couple of you know, sort of practical things you can do to mitigate that fragmentation. One is um, really thinking through the your terminology management um, and making use of things like concept maps and fire to to map from uh, a concept that's similar in, in Thailand to one that's similar in Vietnam, as an example, um, at sort of the, the coding level. Um, there are also, um, uh, I think, a very useful construct in FHIR called a logical model, which def um, is essentially defines your data dictionary. And there's tools to move back and forth between logical models. So um, as you develop a particular application for Thailand, make sure you document, you know, what is the logical model? What is the data schema um, that you're using in that application um, so that for future defragmentation efforts, you have good documentation um, and, and potentially a set of tooling that can help you do the transformations between countries. Thanks, Carl. So <clears throat> what Ahin agreed to do is we will create an observatory and a community amongst ourselves. So in, in the call, we have the Thailand, the uh, Sri Lankans, um, the Indians, uh, they have their own interoperability lab. So we formed a community of interoperability labs. Uh, we hope that you would join. So give us advice on the interoperability developments at the global level, because these are the things that are happening at the national level that we're trying to, in quotation marks, consolidate the knowledge, so to speak, at the regional level, so that there's an exchange uh, of ideas. In the Philippines, I know uh, Dr. Beatriz Tianco is working on oncology and Dr. Janus Ong is working on hepatitis. We'd like to register that so that we it, it, the, the region knows that there is a group in the Philippines working on hepatitis and oncology. In Thailand, uh, Dr. Bunchai's group is working on claims data and active medications. In Vietnam, they're working on HIV. So rather than create another new complete system on HIV in the Philippines, maybe we can talk to the Vietnamese and ask them, can you show us the profiles uh, that you have for HIV? And maybe we can just extend. If there's anything missing or mute things that we don't need in the Philippines, uh, we were hoping to serve that, that role to, 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 to sort of like mediate and make sure that there's communication and reuse uh, of, of, of artifacts across countries. And I hope WHO uh, over there, Carl, with you, Garrett, uh, and Nat, hope you can uh, also give us guidance and advice. So with that, thank you, Carl. Um, I'd just like to end the call. Uh, we, we will see Carl again uh, next um, month. Uh, but on May 18, the hour before that 8 p.m., we will have Jose Costa Tejera to give us a technical demonstration on a process flow of converting paper forms into fire profiles. It's quite a long uh, type of webinar, so we divided it into two parts. Uh, a one hour later at 9 p.m., Carl will uh, tell us more about the Android Fire app SDK, which he mentioned briefly. On May 25, Jose comes back to for the part two of the technical demonstration, and we hope to uh, showcase the hepatitis uh, project that we're doing in the Philippines uh, together uh, with Jose. And then on June 28th and 30th, 9 p.m. Manila, we will then ask a country interoperability lab, our standards and interoperability lab, Thailand, to show us what they're doing uh, with their fire capabilities. So the link here is bit.ly slash ahinr 2022. You can register uh, here in this link and you can join all or any of these webinars. And with that, we'd like to thank uh, Carl Leitner who we will uh, say goodbye temporarily because we'll see him again on May 18. And I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Bunchai for a few words if he's still there. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, always uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, your 
a help and contribution to the to the network and we will uh, we will follow the the uh, the normative that the who has been providing us and then we also would like to uh, contribute to the this initiative anything that the network can be uh, uh, in use or uh, in uh, uh, service with uh, the who uh, please let us know thank you thank you thank very you. much Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bunchai. Good night, everyone. See you next month. Oh, sorry, in the DRG webinar. All right. Bye. Thank you.